Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar uh, that's going to finally address the corporate agenda. It's something I've been wanting to do for a long time to help everyone that is either in a leadership role or in an improvement role be able to bridge the gap, talk the same language, and understand one another so that we can boost organizational performance on all fronts. So it's thrilling to have our guest today, Jacob Stoller, with us, and we're really eager to hear all of the little tidbits that he's learned through his research and writing his book, The Lean CEO. So I'd like to do a quick sound check for those of you who are a familiar webinar uh, attendees. If you could please just raise your hand, let me know you can hear us loud and clear. All right, excellent. All right, I'm going to put everyone's hand down. Thank you so much. Now you know how to raise your hand at the Q&A section if you'd like to ask a question and be unmuted so you can ask it verbally. Otherwise, you can write your questions in the question section of the control panel. So without further ado, let me just give a quick update for those of you who are new to the Karen Martin Group. We do give these webinars pretty much every month. Uh, we are a consulting group that helps organizations in all industries and in all stages of their organizational performance journey. We um, help build internal teams if that's what the organization wants. We actually lead improvement projects if the organization needs a little more skill set or bandwidth. And uh, we work globally. So uh, if you have any needs like that, feel free to give us a shout. Also, I have four books out now, and I'm just starting the proposal for my fifth book, so you can check those out if you'd like to learn a little more about my philosophy. And also, if you aren't a subscriber, I recommend that you consider subscribing. We have a monthly newsletter that's very popular, lots of free content, free templates, assessments, etc., and so that's always helpful for people that are trying to figure all this improvement stuff out. Uh, I'd like to just take a moment to share with you, um, actually, before I do that, I'm going to go back for one second. I do want to, we got a couple of questions at the beginning of the webinar today. I want to go ahead and address those. So if you're not sure what to do as far as getting materials, uh, we have a website now that has a materials page. So if you go to Karen Martin, ksmartin.com forward slash materials, just take a look here. This is where the materials are, and you'll see both a handout that has two slides per page and also a slides version. They're both PDFs, and they have full slides per, uh, per page. And then after the webinar, our webinars are recorded, and you, you can invite anyone to go listen to them afterwards. You can find them here on our website or also on our YouTube Vimeo and SlideShare channels. The materials, the actual PDFs of the, of the slides, will be available on SlideShare. And so if you ever have any interest in learning other areas, you know, we have this really cool little um, index now where it can just bring up all the different webinars we have on different topics. And you can, um, all free, this is how we give back to the Lean community, and uh, we're really happy to do that. So without further ado, I'd like to just share with you a little bit about Jacob Stoller. I met Jacob about three years ago, and one of the things I was immediately struck by is, you know, here's a guy who is not a lean practitioner, and he's not a CEO or a leader in an organization, but rather his background is journalism and, you know, investigative work. And so, you know, I think of Jacob as part investigative journalist and actually part anthropologist, part sociologist, part psychologist. And what I found fascinating was that he was just enthralled by lean, lean philosophy, and that's what led him to write his book, The Lean CEO. He wanted to get into the minds of CEOs and, and you know, senior leaders, C-level leaders, and find out what it was that made them successful, what it was that they had concerns or fears about, and how we can work together, improvement professionals and leaders, in order to boost organizational performance. So he's been able to get into executives' hearts and minds and he uh, can share with you what he's learned, and he's been able to get them open up to open up as well like no one else has. So I am going to turn it over to Jacob. I'm going to unmute you, Jacob, and I'm going to give you control of the keyboard and mouse. And Jacob, are you there? I am here, Karen. All right. Well, welcome. We're so happy to have you on the webinar. It is all well, yours now. Well, thank you, Karen, and, and uh, thank you for having me, and, and thank you, everybody, for uh, for being here. I'm just trying to turn the slide, and yes, we have all systems go here. So I'd like to welcome you all to the land of corporate agendas. Uh, that is really where I've spent a lot of my life. Uh, before I had even heard about Lean, I, I used to work with IT, uh, justifying large projects and that sort of thing. So 
I've seen all kinds of things. And uh, uh, as Karen said, I came to Lean a few years ago and was absolutely enthralled by it. Um, I, I, I love the way Lean deals with business issues, and I really, I, I think it's the Lean community is a bunch of wonderful people, including Karen, who, by the way, is one of the first people I ever talked uh, about my book, The Lean CEO, with. Uh, way back in the planning stages, we talked together about two years ago. So thanks for all that, Karen. So let's get right into it here. Um, at corporate agendas are, uh, again, they can be, if, especially if you've doing, been doing lean, uh, strange and, and, and maybe not completely the way we expect them to be. So let's see, slide, come on. I am just waiting for my slide to turn. Well, there we go. Okay. Hey, hey Jacob. Uh, I'd like Karen. to explore. Uh, hey, yeah. Jacob. Hey, it's Karen. I'm just going to, I don't know yeah. whether it's working, so I'm going to give you back controls, and if you can't uh, advance the slides, then I'll advance them for you. Just let me know, okay? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the arrow key worked, so I, I, I will stick with the arrow key. Okay. okay. All right. So, so anyway, um, I, you know, I want to uh, talk first about some of the basic language of corporate agendas, uh, just so that everybody's on the same page. You know, I'm not trying to give a lecture on KPIs and and corporate measurement or anything like that. I just want to get some things on the tables that we can talk about, uh, so that we can we can all be kind of understanding the same things. Uh, then I would like to move on to uh, six areas of corporate thinking that that a stifle lean. And uh, you know, to be honest, there's probably a lot more than six. Uh, so, but I've picked some some key areas where where corporate where people run into trouble when they're trying to take lean beyond the project level to the enterprise. Uh, finally, uh, we're going to talk about how lean leaders uh, in the lean CEO in the book uh, actually changed the game and took on not just lean, but but took on the whole kind of corporate thinking. That's, that you have to take along with it if you want Lean to really flourish uh, at the enterprise. And finally, uh, we'll talk about uh, how you could join the conversation about the needs of your uh, leaders and of your business uh, in a broader sense. Okay, it's a little bit slow. So I'm going to go ahead and do slide advancing. I don't know what's going on here, but I'll go ahead. You just let me know, and I'll try to follow along. Yeah, I'm sorry. Okay. Okay, go ahead. Ding. I'll have to have a little bell. Okay, great. So corporate agendas are important, uh, you know, for several reasons. Uh, first, I think I did that one. Okay, great. Uh, they define uh, really what's expected. So if you're if you're you're kind of talking with executives and, and trying to get lean sort of moved up on the corporate agenda, uh, you really have to deal with what the, what's expected of these people, and, and they are, are pretty codified in the corporate agenda. Uh, secondly, uh, all these rules determine compensation, so they determine um, how these people are paid. So as you can imagine, uh, there's going to be a lot of sensitivity around the agenda, and there may be a lot of hidden things out there that aren't completely obvious. Uh, but the bottom line is that if you really do want to see lean happen um, on the level that a lot of people would like to see, you know, if you want to go beyond departmental projects and you really want to take it to the enterprise, uh, there are things in the corporate agenda that will have to change. You know, standard to corporate agendas will not support lean. Okay, now uh, just a few. Oops. Just a few notes, uh, much of, of the agenda may not even have that much to do with the business, and that's because uh, there's a lot of sensitivity about the uh, uh, outside people, you know, people reading the annual report, things like that. So often senior managers are thinking about what's going on, uh, what's the annual report um, going to look like at the end of the year. So, you know, I, I mean, these things are... Uh, always going to be in the picture somehow, um, even though they're not that clear. Another thing is, of course, uh, the financial picture, and that's kind of a universal language behind business. I think it's uh, probably not adding anything new here, but anytime we talk about different kinds of metrics and different kinds of goals and stuff like that, there usually is somebody thinking about what's this going to mean to the bottom line. So even when it's not talked about, it is um, it comes into our situations again and again. 
So um, a few words about not-for-profits, and um, you know, I know uh, Karen mentioned that some of you people are, uh, you know, working in that sector. Uh, they are uh, really the the message is this means you. I mean, there is a lot of uh, kind of corporate. Uh, discipline, I guess, if you will, in non-for-profits. Uh, the board members are often uh, veterans of uh, of the private sector, and also sometimes in a not-for-profit, they will get the most conservative sort of people that that really follow the rules, because uh, not-for-profits tend to be pretty sensitive um, about possible breaking of rules and, and and things like that. So it's very important to to keep that in mind. So I'd like to just reiterate one of Karen's slides. I don't know if, if you saw uh, Karen's presentation, Lean in Your Top and Bottom Line, but it just I just wanted to use that as a kind of a, a springboard uh, for for um, to base this on. Uh, and uh, you know, as Karen pointed out, there's really two things that companies can do to improve profitability. One is, uh, you know, they can grow the top line. And then they can also grow the overall margins, uh, you know, hopefully at the same time. So you're trying to uh, increase sales and have your expenses not increase as much. So those two lines, the blue line at the top and the red line at the bottom, are the kinds of things that uh, people are keeping a key eye on. So um, I'd like to talk about some of the ways that we improve the financial picture. And this is just from my experience uh, with business cases. And uh, generally, you know, if you're trying to create a business case for something, that uh, perhaps the, the fastest way to get attention is if you've got something that's going to affect the customers of the organization. You know, if you're trying to do a large project, it's, it's going to have to be something that's going to help the company generate revenue. That gets a, a huge priority. And, and as you know, Lean does a lot of that. I mean, uh, Lean can, can help limited expenses and, and keep price increases from, from happening can certainly uh, improve delivery times, all kinds of things. So uh, there's lots of potential there. Uh, variable costs, that's the kind of thing we hear about, cuts and things like that, the costs that are right on the table. And uh, there's always a lot of pressure on those things. Um, so that's one thing that, that people like to do. And it's also a good business case if you can remove some uh, uh, something that's going to flow to the bottom line right away. Uh, then there's fixed costs. And uh, that's a little harder to do, right? I mean, uh, fixed cost might be a, a building that you have, or you might have a lease on a building, or a factory, or uh, salary to people too. You know, so uh, that's a little harder to remove. Um, finally, uh, and I'm leaving this one for, one for last, but it's the elimination um, or the avoidance of uh, future costs, and that's really uh, Lean's crowning achievement. I mean, uh, you know, when you, I, I think a lot of people have summarized lean for me from the financial standpoint by saying lean is a growth strategy. So if somebody is going to grow their revenues by 25%, they don't want to also grow their expenses by 25%. Otherwise, uh, you're not getting any improvement at all in, in the margins, uh, as we saw in the last chart. So uh, that's our starting point. Um, I'd like to now talk about some of the non-financial measures. And this came in vogue probably uh, in the 90s with uh, Kaplan and Norton, who developed the idea of a balanced scorecard. And uh, what that allows is uh, executives to be measured not just on money, but on some non-financial metrics. So you can see we go around the horn here to, to several different areas, financial. We have internal business processes, uh, learning, uh, learning growth, which is about all your employees, and then um, customer metrics as well. And all that's supposed to revolve around a, a vision and strategy. So um, within uh, each of those categories, uh, executives are going to have uh, a set of uh, targets that they're going after, targets and objectives. So an objective would be a broad uh, sort of uh, thing. Where are we going uh, in general? So, you know, and I'll give you some examples in, in a minute. Uh, performance indicators, how do we measure? What are the days, uh, hours, dollars, whatever? Uh, targets would be what's the number that you have to make. And usually, by the way, these targets are in a fairly short term. You know, you're going to be talking a quarterly target, a uh, monthly target, or, or maybe an annual target. Uh, not a lot of long term thinking, usually. Uh, and then finally, initiatives. They come up with a plan for how they're going to make their make their numbers, as they say. 
So uh, now if we look at just some examples here that, that you've probably seen, uh, the financial uh, target uh, might be, uh, or an objective might be reducing operating expenses. It's a fairly broad thing. And maybe one of the KPIs is cost of materials. And somebody, maybe a purchasing manager has a cost of materials KPI. And maybe he's expected or she's expected to reduce that by 6%. So what's the initiative? Well, get volume discounts. That's a, a pretty popular way to do that sort of thing. You know? And then they might be increasing sizes of orders as well. And we'll get into that a little bit later. Uh, these internal business processes, well, maybe uh, streamline the accounting department. Uh, you know, and the KPI would be maybe days to close at month end. You know, and maybe and the target might be reduced from 12 to 10. I don't know what it is in your organization, but uh, we see a, a huge amount of variability in that kind of thing. And, and a favorite way of doing that, by the way, is new accounting software. They say, well, let's get a software package, and that will make it a lot easier to uh, to move faster because it does workflow, all that kind of stuff. Okay, so learning and growth, well, very typical, you know, improve morale, you know, uh, and and uh, this would be for maybe a VP of HR would have a, a, a so objectives around that, and maybe people are kind of bad mouthing the company on Facebook, or maybe there's just you know not a good feeling around the place. Maybe there's been some some labor problems in the past or whatever. So you know they'll be doing surveys and looking at the the percentage uh, of employee satisfaction, and maybe they want a five point increase. That's that would be a, the kind of level of target they'd be doing. And initiatives could be all kinds of things, events, newsletters, maybe changing holidays, giving people a little bit of flexibility, how they take time off, uh, those sorts of things. Um, finally, you know, we get customer uh, KPIs, and that's, in, in a lot of ways, of course, the most important thing. Uh, but you're going to see quite specific things like increasing market share. You know, they say, they say we want to sell, uh, in comparison with our competitors, um, uh, we want to do better. So uh, one of the KPIs, this is an interesting example, it's become popular in, in the last while, is the net promoter score. And uh, that's really, a, it's, a, it's a very specific calculation. They look at all the people that really love you. Um, uh, so you get the people that just rave about you and are willing to recommend them. Uh, and then they subtract all the, all the people that are complaining about you. So, you know, you might have 30, 35% that are just writing great reviews about your company, and then you might have a 3 or 4% that are complaining. So that subtracts from the total. So, you know, initiatives could be customer service training, and very often on these things, they're training call centers. Because I don't know if you've noticed this, but every once in a while, if you have a, a, a call with a service department in your uh, web host or your your telecom provider, very often at the end of the call, they say, please answer this simple question one survey and they say how likely is it you'd recommend our company on a one to ten scale and you know darn well that someone out there <laughs> some executive has got a net promoter score so that just sort of gives you an idea of the, the kinds of stuff that's going on here now this is really a good news and a bad news story I mean uh, scorecards are great and and uh, in some ways they can allow uh, people to not be totally tied to money, so they can allow for some flexibility in, in setting targets, and, and you can do some really uh, positive things in the corporation. But uh, the bad news is that they can be really, really restrictive, and you see something like net promoter score, okay, you know, that's looking at the high end and the low end, and, then, and you know, when you look at what Lean does, Lean improves you know, they look at the, the value stream. They look at all customers. Uh, so, you know, there may be somebody say, no, 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 I got to spend some money on, on uh, reducing complaints. We don't want to improve our delivery time. That's that's not going to make any difference in my net promoter score. You see, so that's just a rough idea. So uh, the problems we have with uh, this kind of thing is that a lot of non-lean thinking gets embedded into these KPIs. So you set the KPIs based on some ideas that really don't mix very well with lean, and then you're kind of stuck with them because they're written into the uh, written into everybody's performance and it's written in everybody's compensation plans, at least at the executive level. So you really get some, some very, very severe momentum, um, and it makes it obviously very, very hard to change the agenda. So I'd like to... Uh, go through some modes of non-lean thinking, and I'll call them modes. Um, they're really, uh, 
ways of thinking that that uh, detract from lean. And um, you know, you've you've probably seen some of them all. I'm not going to go through this slide. I, I'm going to take these uh, one by one. So let's start with uh, short-term focus. And uh, this is really kind of an obsession with annual, quarterly, and monthly results. And um, it's uh, when you talk about change or anything, uh, you know like lean that's going to really change the way the company does things. It's always going to be, well, we've got to, we've got to make our quarter first before we talk about stuff like that, or, oh, we've got to get to month end, or, uh, well, let's, let's wait till next year. It's because everybody is thinking about, you know, these short-term things, which, again, you know, they are being measured by. Now, there's a, a bigger picture at play here, and, and it sort of affects the whole business culture, and, and it affects what's taught in business schools, and, and this is the whole idea of shareholder value, and, and it's the idea which I, I think came out in, in the 70s that, uh, in academic circles, by the way, that the purpose of a corporation is to make money for shareholders. So, so what you had is a, a kind of a priority, shareholders taking priority over customers and over employees. And it's actually, when I say it's the law, I mean it. I mean, there have been lawsuits where uh, company CEOs have been sued by shareholders because they weren't taking action that, that helped bump up the stock price. Now, a problem with this is that shareholder value is not actually determined by the real value of the company. It's turned by speculation, right? I mean, if people think that the company is going to be valuable, uh, they'll, the, the share prices will go up. And the problem is that... Uh, you know, so that promotes deal-making CEOs, right? You get a, a, a CEO who's willing to, to outsource or, or acquire or do something dramatic, and you get some great short-term value um, of the company. The stock price will go up for a while, and then people will get out. I mean, we've had uh, situations in the news with activist shareholders uh, agitating for, say, selling an R&D department at DuPont. And, uh, you know, it's, it, that would be great for short term, you know, that price is going to go up, the numbers will look good. And then, you know, you've basically sold the crown jewels and kind of messed up the company's future in the long term. So that's a kind of a, a thing. There's a lot of criticism of that right now, by the way. So anyway, that's one of them. Uh, and, of course, lean is a long-term strategy, so if, if you've got a short-term focus issue, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be very, very tough to sell lean in the boardroom. Uh, now, another uh, mode of thinking here is, is what we call either-or thinking, and uh, Karen and I have chatted about this one, uh, but it's this idea that uh, when you're going after something, you, you, there are these trade-offs. Um, you can only get one or the other. And one of the most popular ones is cost versus quality. You know, people are going to tell you, you know, we've got to make a choice. We've got to make a tough choice between cost, do we invest in, in keeping our prices down, or are we going to invest in quality and try to be a quality leader? It's like you can't do both, right? Uh, sometimes a variant on that is they say cost, quality, and delivery. Uh, pick two out of three. Uh, another one is profitability versus market share. You know, um, you know, if a company is, you know, if you've got a great initiative to reduce costs, and and you know your executives are just determined to to bump up their market share by a couple of points, they don't want to mess around with anything. You know, they don't care if it's going to save money or if it's going to make it faster. They just say we're going for market share, we're going for price, and that's the way we've got to be. We're worried about profitability some other time. So there's, a, there's some deep roots in that kind of thinking, and I'll just uh, touch on this briefly. Uh, it's uh, Michael Porter's competitive, competitive strategy matrix, and that says uh, that, and by the way, they teach this in business schools, uh, it says that you have to decide on two uh, uh, axes here. On one of them, you have to decide whether you're a broad scope or narrow scope, and then the other, you have to decide, are you going to be a differentiator or are you going to be a low-cost provider? So, you know, it's really, uh, you know, it kind of, people, CEOs are actually seen as great heroes because they made these tough choices, you know. But, of course, uh, the thing about Lean, uh, the wonderful thing about Lean is that Lean says we can improve these things simultaneously. Uh, you know, and we'll get to see this later in the examples. We can get cost and quality and delivery through continuous improvement. So, very different way of thinking. Uh, the other one, and it, it drives people crazy, uh, I, I've seen this attacked more, more vehemently, I guess, than any other of, of these ways of thinking. It's disrespect for Gemba 
and the people who work there. It's the idea that, that the people that are producing the value that people actually pay for um, are not that important. So, um, you know, I, Minazaki Imai explained this to me really nicely. Uh, he said to me, uh, and I think you all know who, who Mizaki, I hope you all know who he is. He's the author of uh, Gemba Kaizen and, um, and one of the, the, the leading leaders. Anyway, he, uh, he said companies do three things. They innovate, uh, they make things, and they sell things. But he says Western companies are fabulous at innovating. You know, they're very, very good at that stuff. You know, the, 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 the apples of the world and the... Uh, you know the the Facebooks of the world, fantastic innovators. Also, they're they're good at selling things. You know, you've got the Coca Cola, great brands and stuff like that. So if you read the business books about great leaders, those are the things that they're talking about, right? Innovation and, and sales. So not too pe many people get excited these days about producers. You know, people that just have excellent quality day in and day out, year after year. You know, it is considered somewhat boring. And the bottom line for that, all that, is that if you're in Gemba, you're, you're sort of a second-class citizen in some ways, you know, and there's a kind of a, a prejudice, in, in the business culture anyway, there's a kind of a prejudice about people that, that actually produce things. So Lean, of course, says that production, what making Gemba is, creates the value that people pay for. So that's really what, uh, you know, where we should be focusing our attention. And, of course, that's what Toyota was all about, and I think some of the lean successes you're going to hear about are all about. Uh, number four is segmentation of purpose, and that is really a, uh, uh, that's a phrase that comes from Rosabeth Moss Cantor, and it's the idea that you have different KPIs for different departments. So, you know, you have R and D might have a KPI of cranking out a certain number of products or versions of a product in a year. Uh, productions, you know, they're looking at lead times, sales, of course, they got their quota, customer service, maybe they're looking at levels of customer complaints. So what happens? You know, they all got different KPIs. I mean, uh, sales, you know, maybe the, the, the VP sales isn't as making his numbers, so he gives his sales reps a big bonus for uh, bringing in year-end deals, right? So these at huge discounts. So what happens? Well, they bring in this big spike of business production. They, they miss all their KPIs because they can't keep their lead times. You know, and then of course you get problems with customer service. So the whole thing is kind of, you get a lot of people working at cross purposes uh, with this kind of, kind of situation. Lean, of course, says we're all in the value stream together. And that is really one of the primary re reasons why you want to have value streams, because you want to have, you want to really uh, rally all your employees around customer value. Uh, now, here's one of my favorites just from my uh, many years working in IT, uh, blind faith in automation and technology. And, you know, it's a great illustration of, I, I, of this. Go look at a 10-year-old technology magazine sometime and see what they're predicting. You know, it's really quite amazing how a lot of the, this crazy faith about all the transformations that are happening uh, never really come to pass. I think technology still, uh, in, in a lot of situations, is overrated. Um, so uh, I, a couple of things that happen here. One is what we call, uh, uh, in technology, paving cow paths. And that's a term that was coined by... Uh, Michael Hammer, who invented the idea of uh, business re-engineering. So uh, paving cow paths is, well, let's just look at back the accounting example. We had, we said we uh, wanted to fix an accounting process and we got some software, right? Well, maybe there's 12 steps in the accounting process and we want to streamline those. But supposing six of those are waste, you know, what if you don't need all 12 of those processes? So uh, I think uh, technology has a, a really bad way of, of locking in waste. So uh, that's, again, one of the problems. And of course, one of the big stories around that, which we hear over and over, is locking in inventory. When you have these inventory management systems, and really you shouldn't be having inventory at all. So anyway, Lean, of course, says fix the process first. Finally, uh, it's an example of using gap accounting to run the business. and. Uh, this is uh, this is one of the toughest problems for for CEOs to deal with because there's a whole accounting culture around this sort of thing. So um, it's 
just want to go through a quick scenario here. Uh, with gap accounting, let's say in January that you forecast your, uh, you do your forecasts and you set your targets. Uh, February, uh, then the, the managers go and manage to those targets. March, the accounting department goes and looks and compares the actual against the projected. And uh, April, uh, they perhaps in April, they hold the managers account accountable for the variances and they shame and blame them for not making their targets. So, you know, I mean, the whole problem here is that you're looking, you're, you're managing through the rear view mirror, you know, and uh, that's, you know, uh, Lean says what a waste of time and, and also what good does it do to, to somebody's uh, uh, production to tell them something that you should have done six weeks ago. So now, uh, fortunately, there had been a number of uh, CEOs who've decided to change the game and we're going to um, talk about them and learn some of, some of the lessons learned that they provided here. Um, the first one is uh, Art Byrne. And Art's really sort of the classic, uh, the classic American uh, lean business case because he really, uh, Art didn't just bring lean into uh, Wiremold, he actually brought a whole different corporate approach. So a lot of the ideas that we're talking about here, actually I think uh, a lot of people um, learned from Art Byrne. Um, he's really one of the great teachers in North America and like I say, not just on the lean side but uh, on the business side. But just speaking of business, I mean look at these numbers, They're, you're probably staring at them already, they're phenomenal. Uh, operating income up 14 times and you know look at the valuation it's 30 million in 10 years up to 770 million uh, now that was with acquisitions um, but I, I should point out first five of those acquisitions were purely done with cash you know they, they did not even borrow money to acquire these companies that's that's how effective the, the lean work was that they were doing now um, art um, managed the company using uh, value stream metrics. So, you know, we talked about all of these KPIs, right, that apply to all these different departments. Art would have none of that. You know, Art, first of all, he divided the company into value streams. He assigned a value stream manager to each one, and everybody was accountable to these five metrics. Everybody. Customer service percentage, um, productivity, you know, sales over worker hours, quality, uh, and by the way, they're aggressive targets. They're not fooling around here. Quality reduction in defects over previous year, you know, <clears throat> companies like to do five or ten percent, not art. It's fifty percent. You know, these are really aggressive. <clears throat> Inventory turns, I'll talk about that in a sec, but a huge aggressive target. Uh, and visual control was the only one that didn't have, you know, that was qualitative. But again, everybody is on the same boat. Everybody has to make the numbers um, according to the same rules. And by the way, all of these affect the customer. This is value stream. Okay, just waiting for our slide here to change. And, and uh, Art was really <coughs> uh, took on short-term thinking in, in a big way. You know, first of all, these metrics, like I say, inventory turns, he didn't just say three to five. He said, we're going to 20. And people were absolutely shocked to hear him say that. And his answer was, we're going to do it together and we're going to do it over time. You know, we're a team. And Art's idea is you don't play, you don't start a football season unless you're at least hoping to win the Super Bowl. And that's sort of the way he puts it. Now, there's another very important leap of faith here. Art believed, and the numbers proved him right, that you can sell by uh, delivering on time and by delivering quality. And he said, if I am better than all my competitors uh, I, it, in terms of delivery time and I do it without any defects, I'm going to beat them. I'm going to beat them eventually. And he did beat them over time. But he didn't do any kind of fancy, uh, you know, manipulations or any uh, competitive super complex strategies. It was just getting better on those five metrics. Now, Art also uh, really, uh, the moment he arrived at, at Wiremold as the new CEO, uh, and that's in 1991, uh, he uh, did away with gap accounting, not gap accounting for the reporting. Now, that's, by the way, gap is general accept, generally accepted accounting practices. Uh, you know, the idea of gap accounting is that it's, it's for reporting 
results, and it's something you need to do, right? Like the uh, organization has responsibilities to report the correct numbers, and uh, so that the shareholders and people know what they're getting. You know, there's certain legal requirements, but a, an accounting report made for shareholders is not the right kind of report to run a company. And somehow people got that all mixed up. So uh, fortunately for uh, Art, there was already Ori Fiume had already come to the same conclusion because he was concerned about the company and he could see that profitability was was falling and he saw his production managers didn't know what to do about it. So he made uh, a set of simple spreadsheets and that became the way they did their operational accounting. So instead of having these month-end meetings with variances, they had uh, they had meetings where everybody reported on their value streams and uh, they every value stream manager got 10 minutes and that was it. They had to spend their time in the workplace. And art uh, also uh, was very much a matter of a, a manager who managed in Gemba. In the Gemba, not managing the Gemba. You know, there's a tendency in companies to manage the workplace, whether that's uh, whether it's a factory or whether it's an insurance company where there's people processing claims or whatever. It tends to be operated sort of as an entity from a distance. Uh, Art realized the importance of, of Gemba and being in there and understanding it. So he immediately he had enormous respect for workers because he knew that the kind of changes he was trying to make, he needed those folks uh, to make those changes. Uh, he empowered them incredibly. I mean, there's wonderful stories uh, early early in his tenure when they had a, uh, a Kaizen and uh, people uh, wanted, they were trying to, to build some cells and uh, some people came to Art late at night and said, uh, how are we going to, um, uh, you know, or say something, we can't really do this because there's a wall in the way. And Art said, without hesitation, just break a hole in the wall. Uh, just like that, no requisitions, no nothing. So it was just really trusting his people to do the right thing. And uh, Art's, uh, my favorite quote of Art is that your people are the only asset that appreciates. Uh, I know when you think about that, that's a, a very powerful statement. Okay, I wanna get into uh, another one. And by the way, here is, although it's a very, very different kind of uh, business here, it's, um, you know, this is, uh, John, Dr. John Toussaint actually learned um, quite a lot from Art Byrne. So, uh, you know, um, there's a, there's a lot of a uh, lot of you're going to see a lot of synergy here, uh, a lot of like thinking. But uh, what Dr. Toussaint was actually the uh, CEO of a, an organization, a hospital called Thetacare. And uh, he actually uh, retired as the CEO. He's now the CEO emeritus. And uh, after after doing that, he he founded something called the Theta Care uh, Center for for Value. Basically, it's an organization trying to solve healthcare problems um, throughout uh, throughout the world. Basically, so it's a it's a very very broad kind of idea. What he's trying to do. Um, so uh, what he's uh, according to Dr. Toussaint, healthcare has got uh, is in a very very serious conundrum, and I think we can all see that. We can all see the situation that healthcare is in right now. Just go to any hospital and and look at the wait times and and the crises and and, and the stress and all these kinds of things. So uh, the conundrum really is that there are financial pressures that are just uh, unbelievable. We can, with the prices costs can't continue to rise, it's unsustainable. And we have unsustainable, unacceptable, sorry, outcomes. Unacceptable, uh, that's the word uh, Dr. Toussaint himself used. And that really unacceptable because uh, people are dying. You know, you can't have defects in healthcare. You simply can't have them. And so the either or thinking that might work in some situations or you might get away with, is absolute disaster in healthcare. Because uh, defects cost lives, and if you try to cut costs and, and, and remove defects uh, and you reduce capacity, you still got a problem because delays also cost lives. So uh, really, uh, uh, and I guess the sort of the kicker, the big kicker here, one of them, is that when you take defects and you take uh, what they're costing the healthcare system, their estimates now, recent studies, 
uh, that say that that's costing 30 to 40 percent or even higher, 45 percent of the healthcare spend. In other words, the defects that we have in the system are what are driving the costs up. So we absolutely have to fix the defects. Now, uh, the thing about defects in healthcare is that uh, they don't occur as line items in a, in a financial report. Uh, you know, it would be nice if you said, oh, well, we have a quality problem in surgery, so uh, let's, let's take that, let's get a, assign a project team and we'll fix it. You can't do that because a quality problem in surgery, it could, it, there's going to be hundreds of problems. It could be labeling problems, it's going to be storage problems, it's going to be communication problems, there's going to be uh, documentation problems. You know, and uh, so what you wind up with is thousands of problems in, in healthcare. And the only way you're going to be able to fix this is with thousands of problem solvers. So that's what lean healthcare is all about. It's getting people you uh, to learn the PDSA process and to really get in there and solve the problems. And to support that, you need a whole different approach for management. You can't have traditional corporate style management and have thousands of people solving problems. So that's what Dr. Toussaint is working on. And uh, you know, one day, if you look at the uh, back at the previous slide, segmentation of purposes is really a showstopper. You know, you can't have physician autonomy uh, that overrides everything else. You can't have the head of a lab overriding, you know, fighting with the head of emergency either. You know, again, there's a real strong need for value streams. Safety always has to be over authority and uh, work standards have to apply to everybody. And if you read some of the books on lean healthcare, uh, there are some very dramatic stories about um, the kinds of things that, that have happened there. Okay, um, I'd like to, to close with a, a, a really sort of uh, what I find a very heartwarming story about uh, about really what what Lean can do, and uh, and this is about a, a very special leader called Tom Everill. Um, Tom is CEO of something called the Northwest Center which uh, is actually, it's an organization that was founded to provide employment for people with disabilities. Uh, now, Tom was actually a corporate veteran for many years, and, and late in his career, he decided that he really wanted to, he, to add to, uh, see if he could use what he learned in the corporate world for, so, to put social purpose on the corporate agenda. And a quote from him that I love is, what I noticed in the corporate world is that nothing is impossible. You know, he figured he could do this. Now, um, when Tom uh, became CEO of Northwest Center, uh, there was an assumption there. And the assumption was that uh, an organization can either make profit or employ people with disabilities. You could have either or, but you can't do both. Uh, so what they did then is the way they had multiple divisions. So they had some money-making divisions, and then they had some divisions that were providing work for these folks. Now, Tom thought, uh, supposing we could do both and. Supposing we could have all the divisions make profit and employ people with disabilities. Again, he knew what was possible. So to, to test this, um, Tom didn't hire, by the way, uh, uh, Northwest Center was being run to a large degree by social workers who, who knew about people's conditions and stuff like that. But to test this hypothesis, Tom didn't bring in a, a social worker. He brought in a VP of manufacturing who had 30 years experience in the steel industry. Uh, his name is Mike Quinn, and he was also uh, a lean expert. And Mike walked in to these places. Uh, this photo here you see is Electronetics, where they make electronics. And he said, uh, that what he saw, he was expecting to see all these problems because of people with disabilities. And he said, looking through a lean lens, he said, the people weren't the problem. He said, the processes were a mess. You know, and, and he saw just all kinds of unlean thinking, inventory all over the place, uh, just kinds of, uh, you know, unfinished pieces, uh, no flow at all, nothing. So uh, Mike set out to fix that, and uh, he time and time again, he found out that people who we call disabled, if you give them, if you bring the work to the worker, and you give them a process that makes sense, they can be incredibly productive. I mean, I, I, 
I, there, there are case studies where they, they found someone and adjusted somebody's work environment slightly and he tripled his output, you know, that kind of thing. And, and there's just wonderful examples of that sort of thing. So in the end, um, the, the conclusion of all this was that, uh, you know, we were saying, okay, uh, can we do uh, both and? Uh, both and was an understatement. Uh, they found that with these people with different abil abilities, they could, uh, Northwest Center could make higher profits because of their workers' diverse abilities. And I want to give you a, a small example of this. Uh, they had, uh, they have a gift uh, packaging, our packaging business, and the packaging business was making gift bags for Starbucks, you know, holiday gift bags. And um, they made, uh, they were working through a charity division of Starbucks that provides employment for people that, uh, you know, that need this kind of work. Uh, and so they sent in, um, I, I think they made, sent in about 300,000 gift bags. And then uh, Mike got a call from Starbucks and and he picked up the phone and said, what's wrong? He thought maybe something was wrong. And they were stunned. They said, how did you do this? Uh, it turns out the quality record was 100%. And they said, we have never, ever had a supplier that did 100% quality, ever. And it turned out that uh, Mike had people on quality control that had autism. Now, autism is defined often as a disability. But if you're in quality control, autism is not a disability at all. You know, people were doing things that, that you and I could not do. And the, uh, the way the story ends here is that uh, the Northwest Center wound up doing all of the gift uh, kit business for Starbucks, not just the charity stuff. They don't deal with the charity group anymore. Uh, they're their they're number one supplier. So uh, this is just a wonderful uh, example of what you can do if you get rid of either or thinking. And, and just open it up a bit and, uh, and think what the possibilities are. So uh, just a, a little epilogue on, on um, Northwest Center. Three years later, all divisions are profitable. Revenues is up 500%. And uh, Tom really wants to get other employees to get it and put him out of business because he says, how come I'm doing this? Why aren't companies like Boeing um, hiring these folks? So that's that's my uh, uh, positive success stories here. Um, I'd uh, like to talk a little about sort of the future of lean and and uh, and maybe where where some of you folks might be headed. Um, you know, first of all, uh, you know, I, I I'm an optimist, and uh, I I I think uh, there's lots of stuff going to happen uh, in the next while. First of all, uh, in in lean CEO, I, I think a lot of the big moves. Uh, at least half of them happened since 2008. You know, 2008 was a catalyst. So you have a lot of relatively uh, young lean organizations. And I don't mean just practicing lean in some department. I'm talking about it at the enterprise. You know, it really is starting to get there. Slowly but surely, we're getting into the business schools. It's it's a slow process, but uh, you know, there's there's more and more people, uh, you know, thinking about this thing at places like Harvard Business School. And and I think uh, we're going to see some breakthroughs. Um, finally, um, you know, there's a, there's a better dialogue, I think, between lean and non-lean worlds. You know, we're starting to see some conversations on that. And uh, just throw some examples here at you. Um, I, I think uh, on some of the, the ways of thinking that we've seen in, um, uh, as, as I mentioned earlier on, some of, these, some of these modes of corporate things, thinking, I think, I know the tide might be turning. And, uh, you know, one of them is the shareholder value thing, which I said, uh, there is a lot of criticism of that. There's some fabulous books on it, and there are people predicting that it's just not sustainable and it's not really going to last all that much longer. Uh, a great author is uh, uh, Roger Martin. I don't think Roger and Karen are related, but uh, a wonderful author on um, uh, called Changing the Game on here is his book on uh, shareholder value and how that's about to change. Um, Accounting practices, um, I've personally been involved with accounting associations and done work for them, and I know that they are. there is a lot of concern about the way that accountants, particularly management accountants, have been always sort of bean counters who are uh, managing through the rearview 
uh, mirror. You know, they're tired of that, and uh, there's lots. There's some white papers out there and things like inter IFAC, inter International Finan Financial Association of Accountants, I guess. Uh, so there's some interesting conversations going on in the accounting community. Um, tolerance of waste, again, you know, we do have a strong uh, sustainability movement. Um, it's it is driving corporate agendas, and uh, that's certainly going to affect uh, the amount of waste that that organizations tolerate, and we're seeing that already. Some of the best uh, lean talks I've heard have been at environmental conferences. Um, finally, the whole hierarchical management uh, thing has been under attack for quite a while. You know, you can read some of the standard books out there, you know, Clay Clayton Christensen, et cetera, but uh, that's something it has been in the sight glass for a long time. So anyway, uh, you know, I would hope uh, close with a few suggestions here. Um, you know, I, I would really urge you to study lean as a management system. You know, uh, lean as tools um, is really doesn't have legs. You know, it's not really going to go very far until we start to look at the broader thing. And we have to look not just at lean methods, but some of the management methods that will support lean. Um, I would urge you to learn about the business issues in your sector and look for opportunities. So where is the pain in your sector? And particularly, who else is doing lean? I think that's that can also be important. But those are going to drive the corporate agendas again. And you need to understand when people may be saying no to lean or, or maybe uh, you know a little bit slow about getting on the bandwagon, you've got to understand what the pressures are on them and, and be able to articulate um, along those lines. Um, finally, I, I would say enjoy joining the broader conversation and in some of these areas, whether it's the sustainability conversation or the non-hierarchical management conversation or whatever. You know, these are these are ways in addition to your lean training and your lean work that you can help uh, move lean forward. So I close uh, with one comment and that is if we are in these conversations with business people, uh, you know, they've got lots of ideas, but what's been lacking is a roadmap, and I think LEADEN provides the roadmap. So, uh, come on, last slide. <laughs> Just getting to the punchline here, and there we go. LEAN has better answers. I, I really believe that, uh, you know, if you... Uh, if you get into these conversations, whether it's about capacity or employee engagement or about, uh, you know, customer satisfaction or, you know, whatever whatever the problem is, Lean is just has fabulous answers uh, to, to these problems and provides a roadmap. So thank you very much. Jacob, thank you very, very much. That was wonderful. And I just, it's so wonderful that you've taken the time to really talk to these guys and there might have been a lady or two in there but you know to really I hope so <laughs> to hear you know what they've done to help these leaders in the lean community get to where they're at and uh, that was that was fantastic thank you thank you thank you so uh, before we go to Q&A very quickly I just want to point out uh, Jacob's book again lean CEO there's a, a shortened link on Amazon uh, please feel free to pick it up and I recommend that you buy a copy and gently and and you you're using the political savvy, give it to one of your C-level leaders that you're closest to and let them take a look at it. The, the one thing that is missing in the lean world today, you know, by and large, is leadership understanding of what lean really is. There are only a handful of leaders out there that really grasp what lean is. And you know, so many leaders think it's a tool set and they think it's just about process design and that they can delegate it to improvement teams. And, you know, not so. And so this book will help them understand what's really the full package of thinking, mindsets, uh, practices that can help you be successful. So thank you again, Jacob. So let's go to your questions and comments. And there's a couple that have come in already that you can either raise your hand if you'd like to be unmuted and we can you know, do a verbal, or you can type your question into the questions section on the control panel. Um, so a couple things. One was, there was a question about who the person was, the reference for innovate, produce, and sell, and that's Masaki Amai, I-M-A-I, yeah. and I believe, hang on one second, I believe I'm going to try something here, go to my learn, recommended reading, I think I have Amai here, but let's just find out, 
Kaizen, I think, is what he'd be listed under. No, not Kaizen events. I'm pretty sure I have a Mai here somewhere. Miscellaneous? Ah, I know he's in here somewhere, but Masaki Amai is the name. I-M-A-I. Uh, also, one of the listeners has met, recommended John Toussaint's book, On the Mend, and that I'm pretty sure I do have in here. No, Absolutely. I guess, I guess I don't have that one in here. I need to update my books. So On, On the Mend is the book by John Toussaint about Theta Care's journey. And then um, he also mentioned, or someone else also mentioned, the Theta Care Center for Healthcare Value is also a really great organization to take a look at and, um, if you're in the healthcare industry. Um, okay, another comment was, love the story about using those with different and then in parentheses, dis, and then in all caps, abilities. Uh, so, Jacob, someone is very thankful for that. It's a wonderful story, and I think we have to be thankful to those people for the work they're doing. And, and by the way, you visit that place. It is just phenomenal to watch uh, the work there and the, and the flow and the rhythm of the place. It's just something. Right, and I it, I shop at Avon's every once in a while, and they use people of different levels of abilities and things like that also, and it's just really, it's, it's joyful going there. Wonderful. Okay, question. Any comments on how this can apply to the public sector where the shareholder and the customer are intertwined? Hmm, good question. Absolutely, um, and uh, there is a, uh, I, I did have several case studies in the book of uh, public sector uh, now, public sector is a little bit early, a little late to the game. Sorry, um, with with lean, but uh, yeah, it's it's uh, public sector. It's definitely relevant. Um, where they tend to make progress uh, in the short term is processes like getting, uh, you know, if it's getting environmental permits or building permits or something like that. They've they've been um, some of the there are 15 states in the U.S. that are that have got lean initiatives. And uh, you know, there's there's a lot going on in Europe as well. So, um, yeah, it's definitely relevant. Uh, I don't know what what jurisdiction you're in, but uh, if there's not something happening in your area, uh, there certainly are plenty of um, case studies and examples. And and the beauty of of government with Lean is that they're very eager to share what they're doing with other people and collaborate with others. Okay, thank you. Um, another question that just came in is, in your research, have you come across and looked at the strong link between lean and, I don't know if this is a typo or not, constructal law, law, L-A-W, constructal law, maybe it's construction law, not sure, and the need to understand flow in nature and business processes beyond just waste removal. Hmm. I don't know what that, what exactly what that's that's referring to. Constructal. Um, so she's just um, saying constructal law, the study of flow. I've never heard of that term. Have you? Uh, no, I haven't. Um, you know, and and I, I but it's, it's an interesting question. It's maybe something we should look at because yeah. it, it, it's, it is important to look at all these things uh, outside of lean because it's a, it's a wider conversation. Yeah, so it looks like it's a, um, she's mentioning it's a book called Design by Nature from Bejan and Zane, B-E-J-A-N, I, I hope that's how you pronounce it, and Zane, Z-A-N-E. So I'm, I'm going to look into that, yeah. It, it sounds vaguely familiar. Um, you know, another thing I might point out is that I, I mentioned that there, there's a bunch of people that had very, very lean-like ideas, uh, and we should not ignore them. I yeah. mean, Michael Hammer, who talked about paving cow paths, he had a lot of very lean ideas, like, like you know, breaking down silos and all that kind of thing. Um, so, you know, he wouldn't have called himself a lean person, but he certainly did. And then, of course, there's, you know, a theory of constraints, um, you know, which is not strictly lean thinking, but it certainly does get the idea of flow. Yeah. Um, so, so I think it's important that we, that's why I think it's important to, to join the, to, to join the broader conversation. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, one of the points you made that I think is, it's one of the things I run across the most with working with my clients is the either or thinking and trying to help executives and leaders turn that thinking into the and thinking is, uh, you know, it takes a while to get people to break that mindset. What Did any of the CEOs give you any insights into, you know, maybe they started with either or and they transitioned to and and how they made that jump? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I think there was a, yeah, I, you know, I, I'm just, 
I'm just thinking out loud here with Steve Brenneman, you know, who who really was a, you know, one example of somebody who was just focused on either or, you know, you either do this or you do that, and and he, and you know, 2009 struck and or 2008, I guess, and 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 he was forced to change his thinking, you know, um, he he had dabbled a little in lean, and then he realized that you just have to, to, to you know, you have to to you have to improve. Period. Yeah, sometimes some. You can't just, pick some little thing where you're going to win and then, uh, you know, let the other go. Yeah, sometimes a sense of urgency is what really helps you <laughs> shift your mindset. Yeah. And for those of you who aren't familiar with Steve Brenneman, he's the CEO of Aluminum Trailers, and they're really one of the trailblazers, no pun intended, of, uh, of, lean, yeah, thinking, they are. of lean thinking. So um, they're wonderful. Uh, well, I, I think we're out of time here, and I want to oh thank you so – I know that went so fast, didn't it? <laughs> Oh, wait, here's one more question that just came in. Uh, okay. Do you believe that lean ideas can be categorized and formalized into rules slash principles? Uh, you know, there's always going to be some rules and principles. I mean, we can't get away from, from paradigms. Um, so of course, you're, I, I think that's a good point. I mean, if you if you remove all the you know some of the old rules of business, you are going to replace it with something else. And and yeah, I mean, look at standard work for example. You know, uh, look at the if you look at the job description of a supervisor uh, in, a, in at Toyota, I mean, it is very very regimented and structured uh, exactly what they do. So I think the answer is yes. I think you are going to replace one order with a different order. Mm -hmm. I've actually been trying to create some sort of taxonomy of lean thinking and lean rules and I haven't really, um, I haven't gotten there yet as far as you know what what exactly to do but I'm playing around with it so maybe we can mm -hmm. put our heads together and help figure that out. Yeah sure that would be, that's a good one, good project. <laughs> yeah alright well thank you everybody so much and please let everyone know that you know didn't attend in your organization that these are available to listen to afterwards. Give us about 24 hours and we'll have the recorded webinar and the materials in all of its places that you can find it and uh, th Jacob thank you so much and well, everyone, thank you. Everyone have a great day or great evening, wherever you are, whatever time zone you're in. We have 36 countries here, so have a good evening, good day, and good night. Thank you.